Hey everyone, thank you so much for joining us. My name is Amanda Bruegel and I am an award-winning actor and I have the honor now of adding Canada Reads winner to my resume. Now today is Canadian Independent Bookstore Day and to help celebrate and support Canadian indie booksellers, I am delighted to be speaking with photographer, journalist, activist, and author of the incredible book that I had the privilege of defending, We Have Always Been Here, a queer Muslim memoir by Samra Habib. Samra, hello. Hi. <laughs> Thank you for joining me. It's nice to see your face. Nice to see your face. Uh, so, Thank you. So before we dive into some questions that I have for Samara, I know all of you are looking forward to hearing from her. I want to take this opportunity to remind everyone how very important local independent bookstores are to our community. They are safe spaces where we can gather together and explore new ideas and celebrate and share art with one another. So if you have the time and ability, please, please consider supporting your local indie today, right now. Well, not right now right after this amazing conversation. <laughs> and you can do so by either reaching out online or safely within bookstores themselves. Penguin Random House Canada has prepared a link where you can find your local independence. So check it out in the comments below. And without further ado, Samra. Hello. So I have a question. Yes. A question that I don't even think I asked you this question when we chatted. How did you learn that your memoir was gonna be a Canada Reads contender? Uh, I got an email from my publicist uh, informing me that this was going to happen. And uh, I know I was kind of in disbelief and sort of in shock. Um, and we got on a conference call with CBC and they shared the news. Um, and yeah, I think for a week I was sort of like in shock and kind of like processing what is happening. Um, yeah, I think I'm still processing what's happening. <laughs> I know you are. <laughs> like, what? Oh my gosh. Yeah. This is, I'm jumping ahead now. I'm asking two questions and I shouldn't do this. Can you please share your story about how you found out that the whole thing had won and what you were doing? Oh God. <laughs> okay. So I don't know why. Um, you know, like summer is a really busy time for like movers. So I had booked <laughs> movers a month in advance. Um, so I was moving the exact hour that uh, show was live. Um, so when I was watching it live, you know, I was listening to the debates and I was so sure that Eden was gonna win. And I thought I'd just decide to go back to like talking to the movers, just giving them instructions. <laughs> and then I find out that I have won and I told them to just pause for five minutes because I won Canada Reads. So I was basically moving for the entire hour and for the entire day. But I think it's good because I think you know, I had something to do. And like, when I get like really big news, that's like really huge. Um, I don't know what to do with myself. So I'm glad that I had something to channel that energy towards, you know, I was just moving, I had to like, there was like logistics stuff that I had to think about. So I think I was actually good. But I can't believe it yeah. was happening at the same time. Yeah, you called me from the street, I think. Like, I, did. I, was, <laughs> I was like, yeah, you know. It's, uh, yeah, I have to, uh, I'm waiting for my couch to move, yes. Yeah, yeah, that's great. Yeah. Okay, so I have a question for you. Mm -hmm. What was your Canada Reads experience like? I'm really curious to know. Um, it was wonderful and very, very, very tense. Mm -hmm. Um, wonderful, um, because I think, uh, we were able to, uh, have a lot of really interesting conversations or at least kickstart a lot of really interesting conversations that then developed afterwards online. Mm -hmm. I know that I had a lot of great conversations within my own community at home with my children. Um, and I think that's the thing that books do, that they're able to, they're, they inspire a lot of really, really important conversations. Um, the actual experience of doing it was, it was difficult. It was challenging. A lot of people comment on how tense this year was, and uh, it, it was indeed tense. Um, and I'm an actor. And so I am given lines written by other people to speak. And I was very emotionally um, invested in the book. I wasn't necessarily emotion, emotionally invested in winning, but um, once you get a lot of very strong personalities in a room and you start discussing um, pretty sensitive topics, I didn't realize how 
quickly it could uh it could get so tense and charged so yeah. it was it was uh interesting yeah, yeah yeah interesting but wonderful and you were amazing i guess like this one question it's also not a question that's like on the list of questions you asked but that's okay. something i'm personally curious about because you were so phenomenal was there prep work involved in you know you sort of like doing your thing on the show beforehand like how like did you research a lot? Like, you're just so good. Uh, oh, and I'm just wondering, like, what sort of was your process like in terms of, like, feeling prepared to debate on the show, aside from obviously just reading my book? Mm -hmm. Well, I read your book four times. Oh, wow. Um, beca well, because we we only found out we were supposed to shoot in March, and then the world shut down that day. And so I had had a lot of preparation. I had notes written. I had my opening speeches written. Um, I researched. I was going to take a completely different angle on the book. And then the world paused. And then a lot of different things happened personally in, in my own life. And then uh, sort of uh, just the entire re... Uh, um, just the BLM movement being completely reignited and uh, a lot of things changed in between of what our world looked like in between March and when we finally did the show. And so a lot of that um, affected how I, I moved forward in defending this book. Uh, I, I just wrote a lot for myself. I wrote a lot of quotes. I watched a lot of TED Talks. Oh, <laughs> wow. On, all sorts of different things on um, uh, intersectionality, female authors, uh, um, uh, uh, sexual assault, uh, just it, it, a lot, a lot of different things, not necessarily themes that I think are, are completely prevalent in the entire book, but I just wanted to be prepared and I wanted to uh, sort of be inspired by how other women, because I only watch uh, TED Talks by women, how other women spoke. And uh, I pulled a lot from them and I stole a lot of little tips. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think, you know, what I was really in awe of was how you were able to draw from universal experiences to defend the book. And, you know, at times I thought, oh, this is bigger than my book. Like, you know, it's like big, bigger than my book. It's just like pulling from things that are just sort of happening all around us that sort of uh, make the book very relevant to people. Right yes. Now. So oh, I really, really appreciate that. that. Oh, I'm glad. Well, it was it was going to be in March. It was a very different take on it. But then the the fourth reading after everything we we'd all be we all had all been stuck in our homes. Mm -hmm. And but after we had the shared experiences of global pain, um, uh, people in different socioeconomic brackets sort of dealing with the not having work and again systemic racism and just we were dealing with it on such a global scale together that it really, the, the last reading of the book, it made me realize how much this book is not just for one type of person. It's almost a Bible or a manual for everyone. And so it was a, it was a very different take that I had this, this time around. Mm -hmm. Anyways, that's enough of me. Um, uh, so what was it like for you watching the debates? Uh, it was incredible. Like I watched it, you know, sometimes I would forget that I'm actually one of my books is my book is being also debated. Like I just sort of watch it as a viewer and I thought that it was just riveting. And, um, you know, what was fascinating to me was sort of seeing how each panelist was able to pull different things and how differently they were able to connect uh, with the book based on their own life and their own experiences. So I was really, really fascinated by that and just sort of really you know, it made it really clear to me how, you know, oftentimes our readings of the book is, are so dependent on our own lives and our life experiences, right? Um, so I watched it, you know, as a viewer, and then once in a while, I would be like, I would snap back into reality and realize, oh, yeah, like, it's, it's my book. And there were some, <laughs> right. Um, and then there were, um, you know, some really great uh, points that were made by the judges that I think would also really sort of inform my future work. And, you know, it's something mm -hmm. that I ne didn't necessarily think about when I was writing the book a couple of years ago. Um, so yeah, it was great. Good. Yeah. I understand that you like to read digitally because it's easier for you when you're traveling. Is that correct? 
Yes. Yeah, it is. And I feel when I do that, I feel like I am cheating on the book. If that sounds funny, mm-hmm. I'd love, I, I love being able to hold the book. I love, I still have bookmarks. Like I have a unicorn bookmark that I've had since I was seven. I still use my oh, unicorn wow. bookmark. It's, it's holding on by a, a just a thread. Um, but I, I, I just love, and I find that uh, authors, I don't know if this is true, but you take so much time thinking about what font and just the texture of the pages. And I, I just love being able to hold books. But I find when I'm traveling, if I have too many books, I can, they can weigh me down or I leave them behind. And then Mm. that really upsets me. So my father convinced me to start reading them like on my iPad or my phone or, and and now it it works well. So I do, but I, I don't love, I don't love that. Yeah. For me, my, I'm finding, especially lately, books that I read have almost become personal diaries. So I'm reading some amazing, amazing books right now. And, you know, I'm just finding that I'm writing, making personal notes about, you know, things that they remind me of, things that, you know, I've really connected to, if there's an experience that I'm thinking about when I read a certain passage. So they've just become so personal that I almost feel like I wouldn't even be able to share it with other people because I would feel so bare and naked. Um, So, yeah, I, I love like actual physical books. But this, this leads me to my next question. What are, what's something I know that you've posted a, a book that I'm really interested in that you were reading. I'm sure you've moved on to something else. But what what are some of the books you are reading right now? Oh, there's so many. Um, so two <laughs> that I I think I know which book you're talking about. So the first book that I am loving loving right now is Love and Rage, uh, yeah. by Alana Rod Owens, and it's um, it's about how to channel your rage into you know, radical change. Um, Cause so many of us are, you know, feeling so much anger right now. So it's really about how you can use your anger for like the greater good. Um, I love it. And the other book that I'm just so into and a lot of, interestingly enough, I find a lot of for people my age are really, really into is uh, called In the Dream House. Uh, it's by Carmen Maria Machado. So what I really love about the book is you know, it's really rare to come across a book that talks about how queer relationships, queer romantic relationships can also be toxic. Because I think that's something you don't often talk about, like, you know, relationships between two women could actually be also really, really toxic. And so that's really interesting. And it sort of talks about, um, you know, historically trials uh, that were about, you know, domestic violence between two women and how sometimes it's not um, sometimes, but oftentimes historically they weren't really taken seriously. Um, It's just incredible. And, you know, every time I read it, I just sort of feel like, I just feel really, really seen because I think, you know, oftentimes um, when you read about queer relationships or queer romance, sometimes it sort of feels like just two people coming together is the happy ending. Yeah, Like that's yes. it, right? Like, isn't that what yes. you've been, you were longing for all your life? But, you know, yes. I, I haven't really read it a lot where it's kind of like, you know, it talks about the problems that can arise when you have two, you know, really people who might be, car- have, might be carrying a lot of trauma with them. And what happens yes. when they come together? What happens when two people who, you know, haven't had their relationship and their love acknowledged historically for a long time. Like what happens when they come together? Um, Mm -hmm. So yeah, it's just been really, really insightful and I can't believe that it exists and it's been resonating with like so many queer people my age uh, who I've been talking to. And I actually have felt like I can't read this book alone. I've been having like a lot of processing sessions with my friends who have also read this book. It's just so deep. Wow, that was a a very good pitch uh, for that book, both of the books. But um, I I think you're I just it just dawned on me. Not that I think that because I have a the majority of my friends happen to be queer, and so and watching and sort of navigating their relationships, multiple relationships over uh, many decades. Um, I. I didn't realize that most people think that and the, or the stories that we have is particularly about women that that's the end the triumph is that finally when you're together you overcome love and then that's the that's it and then you yeah. just skip down the road and then that's great 
but you're right about the trauma and and individuals who haven't had the opportunity to uh, live openly um, yeah. how that would affect two people and then what that would bring to a relationship but I've never thought of it that way like I've never realized there's yeah. we don't have enough of those stories there's a really um, great line in the book that says you know we us like queer people are so yeah. good at celebrating love uh but what people don't often talk about is the violence that can exist within queer relationships you know wow. um yeah it's just every i feel like after every page i just need to like take an hour <laughs> to yeah. like just yeah. like process um yeah, yeah it's amazing yeah life changing if i were to use you know if i were to describe this book wow wow that's big. You hear that, everyone? That's high praise. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so uh, I'm going to ask you my question, and I'm really curious mm -hmm. about this. What are you reading right now that you love? Is there anything that you're reading that you would totally recommend? Um, I am, and I'm. It's it's older. Um, it, it, I'm saying I'm now now underselling it. I love it. <laughs> I'm, I read it every two years. It's A New Earth by Eckhart Tolle. I find that I I love him and his work, but I find particularly A New Earth helps me or at least trains me, reminds me to be present. Mm. I usually do it if there has been uh, a large event in my life. I read it uh, right after I separated from my ex two years ago. Uh, two years before that, I read it when I um, got The Handmaid's Tale and my career started changing. So I write it when I need um, help and emotional support, but I also write it when I'm going through uh, highs in my life because I do help it find, I, I find that it helps me to become conscious of my ego. Um, it talks a lot about your ego and your id. If anyone's familiar with his work, it can get a little heady and sometimes I do have to read pages over and over again, but it just centers me and brings me back to um, just reminding me to be present and in the moment of where I am that I um, if I allow in a lot of outside noise and particularly if I allow my ego to be activated with everything that happens to me and I take it personally, mm. um, I don't spend, I, I spend a lot of my life putting out fires that don't actually exist. And so right. I, it helps. So I really, I really try to use it every, I really try to read it uh, every two years. Uh, it's the same. I make little notes in the pages. I have a highlighter. So now that I've read it so many times, almost every paragraph is highlighted <laughs> and I use a different color highlighter from every time I read it because I really yeah. also do like to go back and look at uh, certain uh, chapters or sentences or, or sections that really impacted me, say in 2009 versus 2016 versus 2020. And um, sometimes I like double high them and th then make notes. So it's almost like also going back and reading a journal that I like my own diaries or journals because I read the little notes of who I was back then. Yeah. And so it's a nice, particularly after the pandemic, it's been nice to just remind myself to, um, just to stay present yeah. and not get too far ahead. Um, do you feel you talked about this a little bit but do you feel every time you go back different passages resonate with you differently because of who you are now now and how absolutely. do you think that changes every time you go back how, how does it change every time i go back? like how, how what do you think uh resonates with you like how sorry i'm gonna repeat that um like how do different passages resonate with you differently each time you go back? Do you find, you know, specific things resonate with you more, you know, depending on like a specific time in your life? Do you find that at all? Yes. I mean, I think it, it, I think usually when I go back to it, it's because I have a need. I have this little inner clock that says you need resetting. You need Eckhart. You need to go back and you need to remind yourself of how to be present. Mm. And so um, I usually go back if something in my personal life is sort of really becoming the overriding, like overriding narrative of what's going on in my day to day. Yeah. And so when I went through my divorce, um, everything that had to do with relationship and particularly the stuff about ego, it really resonated with me. Whereas before, um, uh, some of the, some of the things about, um, um, 
meditation and self-love and self-care is something that resonated with me. And when I was going through my divorce, I almost wanted to skip over those paragraphs. It's like, I don't need any love. I just want to know about my ego. I just want yeah, to hear yeah. about that ego. And so then I'm catching myself. So every yeah. time it changes. Yeah. What about you? Uh, yeah, totally. It happens to me all the time. And sometimes when I go through old books and I see certain notes and certain passages highlight, highlighted that no longer speak to me, I think that's actually a really great thing because I feel like I've already internalized that. I've already gone past that. Like I've already evolved past like that messaging. So I actually yeah. am like, you know, pat yourself on the back. That's really good. Um, I actually am more interested to know about the ego part. Like, I'm just wondering if you could unpack that thing for me a little bit. Like how, how, Very like, difficult. could you just, I don't know. You don't have to, if you, I mean, I can <laughs> respect your boundaries if you don't want to go there. No, no, it's, the, no, no, it's not my boundaries. I mean, it's, it's, I find it very difficult to explain in his words. And I feel like I'm going to not do him justice. Essentially, we recognize that we all have an ego. Hmm. And I think the thing that I read this time, I can talk about this. The thing that I read uh, uh, this time around is that um, your, all of our egos uh, are, um, they can almost cannibalize our us as people. And the more you feed your ego, the more you react to things happening to you as a personal attack or personal affront, uh, the more life throws you lemons and you act as if it's specifically, you react as if it's specifically happening to you as a an attack on you mm. and not try to remain present step outside of yourself and look at the fact that look at all of your blessings or even remain present and realize that you're not actually being physically attacked because sometimes even if I have a bad conversation or if something goes wrong the way I react in my body it feels like I've just been in, in a fight and that's my ego warning me that I feel uh, I'm, I'm scared or I'm feeling threatened or mm -hmm. anger is usually a reaction when we feel something mm -hmm. unjust has happened to us and so um, just being able to have that, uh, th the ability to step outside and, and talk to yourself and say, you're safe, you're fine. I know that your ego is scared. I'm here. I will protect you. I will carry it for you. Because the more and more you feed your ego, the more it looks for things to consume and eat. And so that this time around, that's reminded me, uh, it's, it's really taught me that it can it, it's like a goldfish in a tank, however large, what is the saying? However large the tank is, a goldfish can grow to the size of the tank. Yes. And so if you allow your ego free reign, it will grow and grow and grow. And it's yes. really taught me this time around to really to check myself and, and talk kindly to even my ego and say, it's okay, you're going to be okay. So that's, it's not what Eckhart says. <laughs> it's that's true. <laughs> It reminds yeah. me of um, a James Baldwin poet. I'm pretty sure it's James Baldwin. Um, uh, he said that, you know, we, we don't see how things are. We see things how we are. Yeah. So, yeah, I, that's really interesting. And I, I wish that I had enough compassion for myself to even treat my ego kindly. I think I'm sort of like, sort of um, raised to sort of see my ego as an enemy, we have this uh, this phrase in Urdu, which doesn't translate well into English, but you know, we say, don't be too proud. And too proud just means, um, you know, someone who just sort of has like a bit of an ego and that's considered a really bad thing in Pakistani yeah. culture. It's like, you yeah. know, like you can have like bad karma, but um, you know, the older I get, the more I'm realizing maybe it's like a good idea to even make friends with like the bad parts of myself. Yes. You have to. You know this about my father. My adoptive father is Indian. And one of the first things I learned in life is that anger is a base emotion and we are not base people. Mm -hmm. So growing up my whole life being taught that anger is a base emotion. And I am absolutely, I would, I would, he would be appalled if he realized I was a base person. <laughs> and so never really connecting with my anger and then accepting it and also being kind to it. I think it's really important, particularly for women. I think Absolutely. it's really important that we're able to do that. Now, I don't want to keep you the whole time. I know we're running out of time. My very last question, and it has to be very quick. I'm so sorry. <laughs> Would you ever think about opening up your own independent bookstore? Uh, maybe. I think, you know, what I'm so, sometimes what I think about, because I like things to be efficient, is 
how cool would it be to be connected to books that were sort of um you know on par with like your music taste and like your taste yeah. in film because I feel like it's all kind of like a, the same universe so yeah I would be interested in creating like a sort of like I don't know what you want to call it but like an experience that includes books if that makes sense it makes absolute sense okay yes cool. I'll go I'll go in on that with you and we'll open up our <laughs> awesome. own independent experience bookstore great that's the name okay. of the bookstore <laughs> Okay, well, thank you so much for joining me today. It's always such a pleasure to speak with you, Sandra. Um, I want to close this conversation by reminding everyone that today is Independent Bookstore in the U.S., and then it is Canadian Independent Bookstore Day in Canada. We encourage you to support local, please, and support local indie however you can, whether it's buying a book or even spreading the news online. And you can do that by following at Penguin Random CA and using the hashtag CIBD online, or you can find your local independent by the link provided in this event description. So thank you so much, everyone, for being on this journey with us and listening to us. I hope you can continue the conversation. Stay safe, shop local, and please thoroughly enjoy reading, everyone. 